Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Call and John Donovan, and uh, we're, uh, we developed a MOOC, uh, which is currently ongoing. In fact, there's about 1,600 people logged in right now uh, on our MOOC, and it's finishing up next week. But what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is, is how we got to where we are today. So it all happened about maybe three years ago over a cup of coffee, and there was a report came out in higher ed that said in 50 years' time or less, about half the 4,500 colleges in the US uh, will have closed. Education will be free for everyone, and Harvard will have enrolled uh, 10 million students. Well, uh, today, if we look at the launch of uh, MOOCs, Coursera already have 10 million students, edX have 4 million, and uh, FutureLearn, relatively new, have about 800,000, and they were only launched since May 2012. So um, there was another report then came out from the Institute of Public Policy Research called An Avalanche is Coming. And I thought this quote was very um, relevant. It said, university leaders need to take control of their own destiny and seize the opportunity open to them through technology. MOOCs, for example, provide broader, deeper, more exciting education. And we kind of said, OK, it's either disrupt or be disrupted. So let's sit down and see you know, what, what we can do. And we said, well, where do we start? It's quite daunting. Um, so we looked at Salman Khan, the Khan Academy, and he started in his wardrobe. So I said, well, I'll start in my wardrobe. And uh, what we did is we set up a MOOC studio in my wardrobe. You'll see on the video later on, there's a, a, a roller blind that pulls down here with the IT Sligo logo. And we set up our microphone and everything there. And uh, that's where it all took place. And then the other thing we said is, uh, where will we do this? And we said, well, if we go to Coursera or edX, they charge you about 100,000 or more. Uh, for production assistance. Well, we didn't have 100,000. Um, and we also uh, wanted to um, use Moodle because we figured all this learning could be incorporated into our own practices. And so why would learn, uh, learn it on a whole new system? And then thirdly, I suppose, with a little bit of Groucho Marx that we wouldn't want to be a member of any organization that would have us. Uh, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about then is some of the teaching exemplars that we brought in. So in the teaching exemplars, we kind of looked at, look, what works for 20 people doesn't work for 2,000. So if you have 5% of your class asking you questions today, you know, three or four students, all of a sudden 5% of, you know, 20,000 or 100 students. So you, you, you really have to figure out, in this case, you know, how you classify, how you label, tag, how people find the content that they need to find. And we leveraged off an excellent book uh, from Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think. In other words, when you go to a website and you're booking a hotel, how, off, how hard is it to find the reserve, you know, make a reservation, or how hard is it to find the location of the hotel? I mean, some people, like, you're trying to figure out, you know, where this is. So we really had to think of the whole information architecture. And that was the first thing we did. Then we looked at the actual learning, and we leveraged off a book by uh, Benedict Carey, and he talked about, um, you know, how we actually learn. He's a New York Times reporter. And what we saw there was that, you know, he, we don't lock ourselves in rooms like we were told to do and turn down all the uh, music and so on. And one of the things we picked up on, he said, like, is giving a quiz at the start of a course where people don't even know stuff is actually more valuable because when we're taking quizzes, are we learning or are we failing? And traditionally, we were failing, but actually we're learning. So we have a syllabus quiz and uh, we put that in at the start and then people start looking for that information and then we introduce the syllabus quiz every week. Uh, the other thing we looked at is this analogy of sport, is why do 82,000 people go into Croke Park? Well, I would argue they're there to support their team, but actually also because someone keeps the score. Imagine if they called you up a week after the game and said, this is the score. Well, we do that in our exams. We give them the exam, and then we call them up three weeks later, and we give them the score, but we might not give them feedback. So two things we put in, we put in a progress bar, <coughs> so people could tick off as they were doing things and see exactly where they were. And then we gave them real-time feedback on their quizzes. So they didn't have to email us. If they failed something, there was a fully detailed response on how they got there. So that brings us um, into David Putnam. And I thought, you know, he said, within education, the streaming of videos, movies, animations, documentaries, and so forth, seamlessly and vividly incorporated into day-to-day -day teaching practice. And then just to finish up, what was the impact? <laughs> I have some quotes here. I think there's one that's really interesting there, where this lady, um, she says, I'm working in retail, I'm delighted to attend IT Sligo's course. Thank you, IT Sligo, I've put my kids to bed now, and uh, now it's off to study. So from an impact point of view, uh, our first MOOC had a 31% completion rate. This is where MOOCs are criticized for having very low completion rates. Our second MOOC is 42% completion rate. From a transitions point of view, 85% were in the workplace, and um, about 80% said they were very satisfied with it. <laughs> and finally, everything that we have here, uh, we've done on the MOOC on the... Um, 
the information architecture is now being rolled out campus-wide in IT Sligo across all of our courses. So that information architecture has been translated to the Moodle. Thank you very much.